Good morning, distinguished colleagues, and welcome. And thank you again for sharing this occasion with us. When I became active in civil society in the late 90s, um, one could describe that period as the golden years of active citizenship and the opening of civic space in West Africa. That was the period when sparked off by the Benin National Conference, the wave of democracy swept through West Africa and civil society were key actors in enabling that movement. They had the support and they got the resources they needed to push the agenda of democracy and its consolidation. But somewhere along the line, that support dwindled. And today, in 2022, a couple of decades after um, this period that I'm referring to, this golden period of democracy, democracy in West Africa is retrogressing. And Paul, you made reference to that. You alluded to that. Now, there's a twist to the tale, though. The actors are different. The tools and the methods have changed, or should I say evolved, now that we are in the fourth industrial revolution. The motivations for civic action have sometimes been questioned. The global political support for social justice and accountability is no longer what it used to be. And resources, as I mentioned, have dwindled. The space for saving our democracy through civic action has shrunk. And often it's through deliberate government action or the action of other power holders. And it is within this context that we birth today the West Africa Civic Space Resource Hub. And let me just apologize because I think there was, we, 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 there was a, a bit of a, a, a mistake there in the publication. It's not civil society. It's Civic Space Resource Hub because we want to focus on the mission of the hub, which is really um, to protect, to save civic space. And its time is now. It is needed now more than ever. Now, as an institution whose sole mission is to strengthen civil society, to be effective, to be efficient, to be sustainable and resilient as credible partners to development in the region, WAXI is very excited to be part of this initiative, working in close collaboration with Spaces for Change, with the commendable support of the Ford Foundation and with other partners who would come on board because this really, and you would hear more from my colleagues as they speak about what the hub is and what it's going to do, you would realize that it is really going to be a resource hub for civil society that will be facilitated by the partners that will be part of it. So Waxi Spaces for Change Ford Foundation are um, innovating it and taking it forward, but we will be having other partners who will be joining us because it's about making resources available to the key actors who need to work to protect our civic space. So that's what it's going to be um, about. Now, we see this as a much needed resource hub. And it's for us, Waxi, it is a crucial part of our reason that it is integral to our mission. So we are in it for the long haul to provide the support civic actors need to reclaim civic space where it's lost, to fight to sustain what exists and protect it from further erosion, because we need that. We need that for a peaceful, just, inclusive, and prosperous West Africa, which, is, which has the kind of people-centered development that we have been talking about. So let me once again welcome everyone who's joined us for this very important launch. And I invite you all to join us in this quest to enable and protect our civic space. Thank you very much for being here and um, being in Ghana, let me say, Akwaba. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Nana, for your kind and good words and welcoming us. Indeed, um, it is the time. This is the time. Um, Victoria, uh, 
Victoria Ibizemu, the Executive Director Spaces for Change. Please, if you can give us your welcoming word. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Greetings. Morning, morning. Greetings. Um, in the last few days, um, I've been at the United Nations listening to various accounts of how the civic space is shrinking in various parts of the world as a result of governments claiming that they are countering terrorism and protecting national security. And when someone from Sri Lanka or the UK or Egypt or Jordan or Nigeria speaks, the stories sound almost similar. The tactics governments are using are strikingly uniform. So these stories validate research findings that show that only 3% of the world's population actually live in countries where civic space is completely free and open. More than 106 countries have some sort of restriction on civil rights and um, liberties. So from legislative to administrative to structural restrictions, all that this government want is how to stifle dissent and limit the ability of citizens and civil society to speak freely, to organize, to assemble and associate without hindrance and participate meaningfully in the democratic process in the countries. So in the bringing it down to the West African subregion, where governance institutions and accountability mechanisms are weaker, tolerance to dissent is even much lower. So West African governments, they are restricting not just the traditional spaces that civil society engages this democratic process. They are also now narrowing the online spaces like the Facebook, the Twitter, the WhatsApp, the YouTube, you know, all of those online platforms that citizens and civic actors are using to draw attention to short shortcomings in the society and to push for systemic changes. So evidence from the closest basis database, it shows that West African governments are unrelenting in their efforts to narrow and tighten the spaces where we operate. So we, like Nana said, we can no longer sit back and fold our arms and watch the gradual descent into civic space closure and repression. Complaining about it is no longer enough. That is why we're excited about this opportunity to collaborate with the West Africa Civil Society Institute to introduce the Civic Space Resource Hub for West Africa. We're immensely grateful to the Ford Foundation for supporting this initiative. This is so timely. It couldn't have come at a better time. Um, over the next five years, the hub will deliver programs that will empower and enable civil society organizations in the West Africa sub-region, beginning with Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal, to have the levers to push back against the surging restrictions. So civil society organizations, um, including civic actors, our allies in the media, in the grassroots movement, in the networks, in the coalitions, you know, we're going to have the resources we need to preserve the civic space through better regulatory compliance, through stronger organizational governance and financial resilience, and also reinforce our digital security platforms and data protection, and also enhance their knowledge and capacity to build solidarity to address the numerous civic space challenges that we are facing. So that is why we're here today. Um, we hope to unpack these programs and answer any questions that you may have. Um, thank you very much for joining us, despite the enormous demands on your time. We hope to continue this engagement with you individually, collectively, organizationally today and in days ahead. This is our collective project. This is a civil society project. This is not just a waxy or spaces for change of foundation initiative. No, this is a whole of civil society initiative. Together, we can win and try on. Good morning again. Good morning. Thank you very much for those uh, good words. Um, and indeed, uh, the situation across uh, the globe is the same. At uh, one 
meeting um, without offending anyone. One person said that uh, our president seemed to be like uh, behaving like the Okada men. You know, the, the where you meet the Okada man, those guys who ride the bicycles, whether in Ghana, whether in Nigeria, whether in South Africa, they behave the same way. So um, it looks like when they meet in some of those conferences, this is what they discuss. Let's terrorize our citizens like this. But then we also have spaces like this. Let's also strategize how to intervene and counter those, um, uh, those uh, narratives. To introduce us more and welcome us is Olof Nyeka Barua, uh, representing um, Ford Foundation West Africa. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Paul. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. I have just given this uh, small remarks uh, on behalf of the regional director for the Ford Foundation uh, Office of West Africa, Dr. Chichi Anyagoli Okoye. Um, I want to say congratulations to WACFI, congratulations to Spaces for Change and all the organizations that have made this possible. Uh, the Resource Hub Initiative uh, is a global effort aimed at responding to the challenges faced by civil society organizations within the context of the increasingly shrinking civic space and the fallout of the pandemic, as we all know, which on its own has also uh, resulted in a further shrinking of funding for civil society organizations. And that's going to in the future lead to more uh, a widening of the resource gaps for, for supporting uh, movement. So the hub builds on the work that the foundation has been supporting with regard to reimagining the role of civil society and strengthening the engagement of civil society with uh, regional organizations like ECOWAS. The hubs, of course, will serve the purpose of identifying gaps in civil society capacity, providing training, and it will also help create spaces for them to connect with each other. Ultimately, uh, we're hopeful that the hub is poised to strengthen civil society capacity and resilience, and to expand the civic space and you know, promote democratic consolidation in West Africa. Like uh, my sister Victoria has mentioned, uh, the closing civic space is a reality. Uh, and Paul mentioned, he also talked about how it appears that there is some concession among African leaders about closing the civic space. Paul therefore believes that through these efforts uh, for the resource hub, we may be able to contribute to positioning civil society organizations to be even more effective and resilient in, in, in our efforts to improve systems and policy outcomes across the region. Thank you for listening and I'm really looking forward to uh, a great launch and a wonderful conversation. Good morning. Thank you very much um, for your good words and uh, more so for supporting uh, this initiative. We need um, more actors uh, like you. I feel envious that uh, this is happening in West Africa and not in the whole of Africa. So, um, but I, I pray and hope that uh, it can, uh, the wings can spread to other regions of Africa. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, very much uh, for the foundation. And please uh, continue doing that. Um, your work is really um, contributing a lot in terms of civic space, even in other uh, regions of the, uh, of the continent. Um, we need to shift the gears now, having been uh, welcomed, having um, heard from uh, good words from our um, our hosts and our supporters. I think it is the point uh, at this point that now we need to uh, reflect more on uh, what is changing in our environment. What is um, the state of uh, civic space um, in uh, across West Africa in your countries? Uh, and um, I want that uh, when we have a very good uh, team of uh, panelists, but at individual level, uh, you should be able to bring out um, um, 
these points, these developments uh, at the point when we get questions and answers so that we understand what is happening in your respective, um, uh, respective communities, respective countries, and how best uh, we can, because some of you have, or some of us have come with the initiatives that have uh, somehow worked. So if we can share that, if we can benchmark, you never know. West Africa could be um, a model in terms of promoting and um, respecting civic space. To um, take us through uh, this, um, uh, this session, we'll first play a video, just a, sh a short clip to introduce us, to see what is happening in different parts as uh, we reflect. Um, IT, take us through the video, it's coming. At least two people were killed and 15 others wounded on Tuesday in Guinea's capital, Conakry, as political protests intensify. Witnesses say in some neighborhoods like the opposition stronghold of Dixin. moment the Nigerian army opened fire on young protesters. The shooting was captured on mobile phones and even live streamed on Instagram. So why a year on do Nigerian authorities deny it ever happened? Yeah, indeed, which country is next and where do we go from here? To reflect on this and to contextualize more on the situation, the state of civic space, we have our team of panelists. Um, 
who will have Obediu Bayou, Country Director, Nigeria, Global Rights. Obediu um, is a, a specialist and oversees natural resources and human rights program. She has worked with community organizations in Nigeria, including the Negotiation and Conflict Management Group, the Center for African Policy and Peace Strategy, and the American Center for International Labor Solidarity. She was a fellow of women's law and public policy in the leadership and advocacy for women in Africa program in the Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, DC. In addition, she is an accredited mediator, dispute resolution trainer, and HIV AIDS uh, youth counselor. Um, Obey, Obey, Obey you, the floor is yours. Apologies for um, a tongue twister in your name on my side. But by the time we finish, I'm sure we will have known how to do it well. Please, the floor is yours. You have five minutes to take us through on what you think is the state of civil space in West Africa. Thank you. Good morning and sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. can hear Good you. morning and thank you so much for having me. My name is Abiodu Bayou. Abiodu Bayou, yes. Uh, but thanks for your kind introductions. Um, it's a very, African languages are very tonal. And so I will excuse you this time. But please, my name is Abiyo Dubayo, and thank you so much for having me. I think that video has shown you the true state of um, the civic space in West Africa, the, the, the regression of civic rights and of the space. And of course, there are many reasons for this. Uh, the core reason being that the space has never truly been free, that we've always had to contest for this space. And if we must continue to hold this space, we must continue um, to, um, to push its frontiers. And um, having only five minutes, I, I'm, I'm going to speak really fast and I'm going to speak to just the Nigerian experience that there have been retrogressions in um, the civic space in Nigeria, especially from the 2000s. But then when you think from the early 2000s was when democracy was meant to have been, been entrenched in Nigeria, how then were, was the civic space um, how, how did we notice the regressions in the civic space? I would think even more so in the past um, six to seven years in Nigeria, there have been specific attempts at using laws to shrink that space further. For example, there have been the NGO laws, there have been attacks, physical attacks on, um, on, on uh, actors in the civic space. There have been the use of laws uh, to repress the civic space, there have been bans on specific actors in the civic space. So for instance, you've had instances where organizations have been shut down in the Northeast of the country and the excuse for uh, of the excuse of um, security expediency. Now, to be clear, the government, the current administration in Nigeria got into power on the heels of the civic space, of social dissent in the civic space. And to stay in power, they felt they needed to keep dissent at bay. Uh, and they've used uh, the securitization of all issues to close the civic space. So um, elections are securitized, heavily militarized in Nigeria, making it very difficult for people to walk within that space. Uh, the media is constantly harassed uh, and constantly people are restricted from being able to speak in the media. Uh, you watched clips from the NSARS movement. And uh, one of the things that is important to realize is that government actually banned uh, or suspended three media um, organizations in Nigeria, major media organizations for covering the NSARS movement um, dispassionately. Uh, I've been asked specifically to speak to recommendations on how to strengthen the civic space in Nigeria. And so rather than go over all that um, we already know, first I will recommend that you could read um, our, um, our research on the civic space, on the shrinking of the civic space in Nigeria called We Know Go Gree. I will share the link um, in the chat later on. But first to say that we need to up civic rights education to a critical mass of people, both in Nigeria and in West Africa that we just don't have enough um, understanding 
of civic rights um, in this country. Um, we also need to ensure that when people are giving the tools to un understanding their civic rights and their participation in the civic space, that they're also given platforms with which to um, with which to exercise this uh, rights as well and to dialogue on what these rights are. We need to make a case for business sector support for the civic space. We need to help the business sector understand that except that the, business, the civic space in Nigeria and indeed in West Africa is thriving, businesses cannot thrive. In the shrinking of this space, and if you look back to the early 2000s where the space was a bit wider in Nigeria, how businesses prospered in that era, to the shrinking of the space currently, and now how that is impacting businesses, how is, that is impacting the economy in Nigeria, that should make a case for business support for the civic space in Nigeria. We also need to up legislative ally building. Um, a lot of the laws that, a lot of the attack against the civic space in Nigeria are legislative in nature. And then it's also beginning to spread, of course, to other West African countries that if we're able to build strong allies within our parliament, then we'll be able to help them understand, incentivize support for the civic space um, and um, support for laws that would enhance rather than repress the civic space. There's very little international highlights on the civic space in Africa. For many reasons for this. Africa is just generally not taken serious, seriously. But if we are able to increase international focus through international media on the civic space in Africa and on the actors and, and on those who repress them, perhaps then we'll be able to also bring to the fore the issues and uh, be able to push back on the um, oppression of the space. One of the things that's also lacking is community organizing skills. So while we say educate a critical mass of the public, how do we enhance the civic space beyond just civil society organizations to ensure that everyday citizens in, in Nigeria and indeed the whole of West Africa are able to um, participate in, in governance of their countries and in the different sectors and um, issues that affect them. Community organizing skill is essential for us to build movements. We cannot protect the civic space if we cannot build movements in West Africa and community organizing skills are critical to that, particularly of very young people. Uh, West Africa is more than 50% of West Africa is um, young people in, in the youth population. And that is where we should focus on the community organizing skills largely and also particularly women. We need international solidarity, not just international solidarity, solidarity within the continent itself. Why aren't civil society organizations, for example, in Nigeria, speaking about the uh, repression in Tanzania and Uganda, repression in um, Senegal and offering solidarity and vice versa, that those countries are also offering solidarity across borders. We need the solidarity. And, and this is something that I'm hoping that the uh, civil uh, so, so the civic space hub um, would be able to champion as well. Um, we need to also empower civil society organizations within um, West Africa on regulatory compliance and also um, on mainstreaming civic space issues. Now we, it, we mainstream every issue on health, or, but then on the space itself, we really need to do a bit more on mainstreaming civic space issues on the protection of civic actors um, and activists. Um, we need to invest in hostile environment training and also on the resilience of the actors in this space, on, on the resilience of activists, not just financially. Financially is also very important because that is what is also reducing the number of people who are participating in this space, but also their mental resilience. It is exhausting more. Um, Nana, um, Lara, both of you have worked in this space for several years, Funke as well, and one of the things that you know that has pushed a lot of people out of this space is that the mental bandwidth that it takes to stay in this space and be resilient is quite high. So while we get funding to support the work we do, we do not get funding to support activists 
to support rest, to support being able to step back for a while and be able to come back um, and to engage with the phrase. And as long as we're not able to support wellness and mental resilience, we will continue to lose our critical actors um, in, uh, in the space. And finally, we need to invest in the next generation. We need to invest in young people um, to take over. The, the, a lot of people at the top are tired but it's shrinking more at the base. Young people are looking for more lucrative employment, um, are, are refusing to take this as, as a full-time thing. And they've also been moving from organization to organization. And you can understand why. They see us burn out at the top. They see that this is a never winning battle. But we need to incentivize, train and build up a new, a next generation um, of activists, and we need to start very, very early. We need to invest in the media. We need to invest through arts and culture in this space as well. Um, I found, and I, and I know they've been researching this area as well, that the arts have, I'm, I'm sorry, re rejoice, your, your microphone is on, that the arts have been very instrumental and actually more instrumental than laws in building this space, in, in strengthening this resilience, in inspiring. Uh, and so I'll just this point because I know I've exceeded five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Abiyo Dung. Perfect. Um, yeah, <laughs> I told you by the time we finish. I will be able to say. Uh, colleagues, uh, this meeting provides interpretation services. We have both um, English and French. So if you check, uh, depending on which uh, tool you are using, if it is a laptop, I think it should be on your left, on your right side of the um, uh, uh, computer. There is interpretation. Click on it, there will be two um, uh, languages, English and French, and then you choose uh, whichever is appropriate to you. Thank you very much. Yes, um, you've raised um, an important issue uh, in terms of investing in the future, investing in the youth, but also strengthening uh, the current structures uh, that are involved in, um, um, uh, in civic space promotion and protection. We cannot emphasize that the more. The, uh, for sure, um, and, the, and our, uh, I think I'm going to get red cards, rejoice, rejoice, I'm going to give you a red card. Um, um, I, I think our governments have learned this art of buying the youth because they look at you, uh, uh, Nana, you are in a civil society organization, what have you done for yourself? But someone, a politician in one or two years is able to, you know, amass apartments, can drive all these types of cars and things like that. So as long as we don't um, empower the youth, I think um, our crusade may end um, uh, sooner than later, uh, which we don't want. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Kojo Asante. I hope uh, there I have the names. Um, uh, Kojo is the Director of Advocacy and Policy Engagement at the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, Ghana. A legal policy and governance specialist, his research focus is in the politics of development, particularly the role of coalition politics and the implications for development outcomes. Uh, Dr. Santi's diverse range of interests and experiences include also anti-corruption, social accountability, local government, human rights, natural resource governance. I can continue. I've not put a full stop, just a comma. Please, Kojo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, really pleased to be here um, to join all of you uh, and uh, greetings from Accra. Um, this conversation, I think, is very, very important, and uh, um, I'm really glad we are we are having it because I believe that you know when when we reduce everything at the end, it's about people's lives, um, our futures, uh, the future of our children, our brothers, our sisters. That's what it means. It means uh, living in a, in a society 
uh, where you can, you know, express yourself, participate in decision making that affects your life. So, um, you know, when we strip all of it down, this is really what it means: is we are we are fighting for, you know, our own present and our own future, and, and that's why I think uh, we have we have no excuse. Uh, we need you know, to, to protect the space. We need to push back and ensure that that space provides us all the, uh, the, the benefits and the freedoms that we need uh, to, to live uh, as, as human beings. Um, I'm supposed to focus on Ghana. And I will start by talking about uh, maybe, you know, some of the developments uh, around the attacks on freedoms that, uh, uh, needs to be highlighted. I think the, the most obvious one is uh, around the, the freedom of the media. And if you've seen the, the, the recent uh, World Press uh, Freedom Index, where you know, Ghana uh, dropped almost 30, 30 places down to number 60 uh, for the first time, uh, indicating that there's been a real deterioration in respect of uh, freedom of the media. Uh, we have, most people think of Ghana as the model democracy uh, and, and not just in, in Africa, but you know, can competitively say that some of the freedoms we enjoy, particularly for the media, uh, it's, it's, it's recognized worldwide. And I mean, this development, uh, I think uh, it's a wake up call, but, but the evidence is there. There is increased uh, assault of, of journalists I mean, some of the stories are horrendous. People's, uh, some people have completely been disabled, you know, and the perpetrators are state officials like police, security actors, you know, political actors, as well as private citizens. And the, the effort to hold these people accountable has just not been there. So you have young journalists who are out there trying to just bring the news to the people, to inform the people, and they get attacked just because they dare to, you know, collect, you know, these even videos, uh, a, a public official conducting uh, uh, an activity in public, and they attack them, beating to the point that you know they 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 lose the their hearing and and other things, and you don't even get a resolution in terms of those officers being uh, outed and prosecuted, so that it, it's a a deterrence for others. So these kinds of actions has, um, you know, signal uh, a real worry for even a country like Ghana. And I think we have to acknowledge that there are certain developments that have allowed this kind of behavior and impunity to thrive. You know, one is that our politics is becoming very, very transactional. Um, the parties and the individuals who are going to these parties are just going in there uh, basically to seek power and and use that power to you know uh, reward themselves so um, the there is really lack of restraint in trying to deal with and, and an appreciation of what uh, the role of a, a media person should be in a democracy you know even if that person has to go and cover a political event or bring the news it's the same with the security you know, that impunity exists because even the recruitment into the security services has become so partisan and, and, and all personalized that some officers don't even understand what their role in democratic policing means. This is, they personalize these things. So you dare not video them because they obviously know they are, they are committing a crime and they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be outed, you know. So, that the, the area of the media is a worry for us um, and, and that's work we have to do on it. Also online freedoms and uh, the case of uh, Baker Obama or uh, the Fix the Country uh, uh, activists who you know, posted online uh, if, uh, you know, uh, statements which uh, uh, related to whether he, he was interested in coups and so on and this has become uh, he's been charged with treason, um, and 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 there's been enough a number of uh, media people who have also been arrested because they've either done a YouTube video or something that is insulting the president. 
and all these uh, colonial laws about uh, causing fear and panic and uh, pseudo criminal law, uh, uh, you know, provisions have been uh, resurrected and being used to, you know, uh, to, to, to punish these people. So um, that space for engagement, which is the online, is also an area. Uh, certainly, uh, there is a genuine concern about uh, it's being misused for misinformation, uh, for for even terrorism, other kinds of security, cyber security issues. Uh, but the the approach, you know, uh, and the instinct of the state is basically uh, to stif uh, stifle dissent of any kind uh, under the pretext of you know uh, security. So finding the right balance. Uh, that should exist within a democracy, I think, is is, is key. The other area uh, uh, is the right to assembly and dealing with protest in particular. I mean, if you if you look at what the uh, the, the armed conflict location and uh, events map uh, project tells us about protests in Africa, uh, this is not going to stop anytime soon because we have a very uh, young demographic uh, uh, group. Um, uh, they, 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 they have different ways of expressing dissent, you know, or different kinds of civil formations that are emerging to deal with the repression. And uh, our police uh, institutions, our security institutions have not built the capacity and the orientation in terms of dealing with these kinds of, of uh, protests. They are just used to basically clamping down on any free expression of any form and just afraid that you know people going on a peaceful demonstration is a threat to national security uh, and we see what happens with the NSAS movement and the kind of clamp down that we saw and we see it in many places so the 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 the, the management and and the capacity to deal with these kinds of civic expressions uh, I think it's, it's key. And uh, you know, how those spaces are managed are, are critical for how civil society is able to engage. Now, how do we, you know, what, what do we need Yo, to do? Uh, Can you sorry, sorry, yes. Um, the time is My fast time is spent, okay. but we could uh, add in one minute, please. Thank you. Sure, all right. So, I mean, for me, in terms of uh, what we need, in, in Ghana, there's already a number of laws that uh, we are in the offering. So there's an NGO, NGO bill or non-profit bill that is uh, currently in the offering. We have to engage with that. There's a broadcasting bill that we have to engage with as well. Um, but I think that for me, one of the things that I, uh, you know, st stick out to me is that there's a, there's a generation of civil society actors. And I'll say it's like the second generation after the third wave of democratization. Uh, that probably are not as steeped in the fundamentals and the principles of human rights and democracy and governance, and sometimes miss the point between all the connecting dots. You know, so when something is happening on, you know, freedom of expression or right to assembly or any other kinds of issues of accountability, transparency, they are not understanding that these all enables uh, to protect the space. And so you see people uh, uh, acting in silence because they think, oh, that's the problem of somebody else to deal with. So I, I mean, for me, the recommendation is really to go back to a DNG Human Rights 101 for uh, a lot of these society leaders who are the second generation, who didn't naturally come. The first generation came from academia. A lot of them either political scientists and other who kind of have a prior appreciation uh, of these uh, principles and, and, uh, uh, and concepts. And I think that we have to revisit that because you can see it in the way people uh, respond and react uh, to these issues when they come up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kojo, for your analysis of the situation in Ghana. Yes, and indeed, uh, the transaction of politics uh, keeps spoiling almost every space that even they find but when they have transacted now they want to keep the status quo they again change the games and uh, this was also alluded to by uh, uh, uh in terms of um keeping their status quo by 
make sure they muzzle uh, each and every voice that is out there. Um, our final uh, uh, last speaker on this segment um, is Aisha Dabo. Um, Aisha Dabo is the coordinator of Africtivists Project. She has been at the forefront of several offline and online campaigns on human rights, democracy, rule of law, good governance, and women's and children's rights in different African countries. Ms. Dabo has built a career as a media and communication professional focusing on the African continent and diaspora. Uh, she has extensively traveled as a senior reporter and editor around the continent covering major events. Since 2012, she has worked on communication for development organizations. Uh, she holds a journalism degree, um, a BA from the University of the Gambia and a Master of Arts from the University of Del Morgues, France. Dabo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, um, Paul. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, and Waxi for the invitation. So I'll be talking about Senegal. Um, we, we, in the past, we used to pride of ourselves and still sometimes until now that we are one of the rarest country on the continent that has never gone through a coup. Um, but one thing should be noted that from since 2012, there have been a slide, a uh, downward slide when it comes to freedoms in general and specifically um, basic human rights. And that of course has been affecting the, the uh, civil society and the civic space. So uh, fast forward to um, 2021, that's when we had the, um, in March when we had the crisis um, and the number of protests actually in which um, at least unfortunately um, 14 people have lost their lives and this was somehow a surprise for some people but it was not for us who have been here and have been monitoring the situation and uh, the March 2000 and, um, uh, 2021 event is just a build up of the different uh, problems we've been having uh, when it comes to peaceful protests. Um, you need uh, uh, actually the the prefect of the prefect of Dakar or any other place will require that you get an approval. While that's not what the constitution is saying, you just need to notify them. That's one example. The other thing is the abuse of power, be it of people um, who are close to the ruling. Um, party or the ruling coalition and the abuse they have, the dilapidation of uh, public funds, the embezzlement. And uh, another, when it comes to the citizen side, it's a continued frustration, continued um, hearing all these natural resources that are being discovered on the, on the, in the country while they're not seeing the tangible effect of how their lives are being changed. And on the other hand, you have these people that had nothing one day and the other day they, they become, became um, super rich. When it comes to the media, we've seen a media, it's not completely polarized as in some countries, but we are seeing the, the, that it's you know, less, more and more obvious that the media, different media houses are supporting either the opposition or um, the ruling coalition. And some are trying to you know, be in the middle and try to be as impartial as possible. And um, of talking about the, the media, there's a, one of the um, what, a media organization, um, De Media, which is the media house, it has a TV, um, radio station and a newspaper among other uh, media uh, components has had um, the accounts frozen by the, um, the income and tax uh, office because according to them, they did not pay all their taxes while the organization is stating order. So this has some people are interpreting it as being linked to the fact that the founder of the media group is um, an opponent of the president, a dissident, 
And uh, as we are preparing for the legislative elections, um, some, someone has their mic on. As we're preparing for the legislative election, there's some tension going on right now because um, since the last presidential election, um, you know, the law requires that a candidate gets a number of uh, people that will sponsor them. And this has been an issue um, in the legislative elections. And uh, some of the, uh, the opposition coalition have seen um, the, some of the, the list that they've prepared actually come up with issues. And civil society came out yesterday to try to, you know, calm down, calm down tension because, um, of course, we don't want to see or have what was what happened in, in March repeat itself and try to calm down tension and tell people to just, you know, that the commission the, uh, organizing the election should be more flexible and try to make sure that everyone participates because there's a number of um, people's whose uh, candidacy have been rejected. So now I will focus on um, well, uh, what is the recommendation I would have specifically when it comes to Senegal. And one last point before that is the fact that the president since um, the last two years has been constantly, you know, saying that he wants to regulate social media and uh, that they're preparing a bill actually in that regard. Why Senegal already has a number of laws that address everything that has to do with the spice, uh, cyber space or any right that can be, um, you know, violated in the cyber space. So our stance now is we, we want to see what that um, bill looks like. Uh, before it goes to parliament because the robust stamp parliament because we don't want another law that will create restrictions but we want uh, something that will be more collaborative and uh, respect basic human rights as much as possible so the recommendations i have and i think maybe would be um, similar to what my colleagues have said it's unfortunate that Senegal is going to a downward trend and it's mostly linked to to, to, to politics and to people wanting to stay in power and stay in control, not wanting to hear any dissenting voice. So I will first focus on civic education. Um, civic education that's impartial, not in support of our, uh, of our current or past president, but just be as impartial as possible. That's very important. And it's civic education at all levels. There are existing structures from grassroots to national level that could be used for that. And um, I will talk about also the fact that um, government should, you know, stop being uh, closing themselves in this bubble that, you know, they're the one who decide, they, they think they know what's best for everyone. We are no longer in the, those kind of governance. We are more in a collaborative and participatory democracy and governance. And one important thing is the fact that if they have bills um, that they want to put out that will affect um, basic fundamental rights, um, they should actually be comfortable with, enough with what they're suggesting and open it to civil society contribution and criticism so that it will be a more collaborative um, law. Because when um, the trend has been, when they, but they have difficulties um, in terms of controlling um, protests or controlling um, the civic space, they will pass a law to try to legalize it. And uh, uh, having this collaboration actually is uh, something that can help us move forward. And um, someone Fisher, talked about- one, min one minute, please. Okay, okay. Someone talked about um, solidarity uh, and that's very important. During the NSA uh, protest, there was a, a continental solidarity and during the Free Senegal protest that happened last year, there was also this big solidarity from other African countries. This just shows that we all yearn and want the same thing. And we no longer want to have these, the club of, club of head of states who only think about how to stay longer in power or how can we repress further our, our citizens while you know, they're in service of us, they're working for us. So that should be, um, you know, the, the, they should be more compassionate or empathic towards citizens than trying to strengthen and restrict um, the little freedoms that we've been able to gather uh, so far. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The uh, point of solidarity keeps coming. And um, I know when it comes to civic space and especially the actors that are um, either being harassed or mistreated by their governments, it's always good to have this uh, solidarity points, uh, missions, or hubs where, for instance, one can easily be either evacuated or um, help to um, to come to terms uh, with the, what is happening. So thank you very much, um, our panel, um, for elaborating more, for contextualizing and grounding us in Nigeria, in Ghana, and Senegal state of affairs in terms of civic space. Um, we are not doing um, well in terms of time, and um, I'm worried that uh, our next uh, session, which is comments, questions, and uh, answers, is going to be short. Please, um, you can put your question also in the chat. And uh, if the question is asked, uh, you don't need to repeat it uh, so um, that we can have enough time to um, listen to some of the comments that are in the audience there. Please, let's have uh, five minutes of questions uh, and answers. And if you are you want, you can specifically put your question to uh, the panelists, including our first uh, um, uh, three uh, hosts uh, who gave us the opening and welcoming remark. So please, the floor is open for comments, questions, and answers. And someone should keep an eye on the chat room in case a question drops there. And if there will be silence for more than 10 seconds, we would gladly move to the next uh, segment. Yes, Daniel, please, uh, you have the... You have the floor, Daniel Alimo. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I'm an interesting one, of course. I'm calling, I'm uh, speaking from Ghana, Accra, and uh, greetings to. Omo, uh, Nana, Charles, and Ko Dosak, and then uh, Dr. Kofi Asante. Uh, quick one. My, my, the, the first speaker talk about uh, civil space uh, shrinking in Nigeria and Africa. I also want to ask, is it only the space that is shrinking, or the, uh, also there is um, apathy on the part of uh, civil society or civic activists? who are known seeing uh, tangible results for the activities civil societies are involving. Okay, thank you very much. So that will go to Abiodun. Um, uh, Lindro Ben Bannon, Lindro Bannon, please. Thank, thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Paul, and also for all the presenters. <laughs> And let me maybe play the devil advocate here. And I mean, talking about the issue about uh, protests, not allowing people to descend on the streets and express their, their view on a specific issue. I wanted to find out, uh, have we not have reached to the point that protesting now and is becoming uh, a tool Use also for other people, for example, hosting, I mean, and democratic elected governments like what happened in Mali, what happened in Egypt some years back. Should we not start thinking about using other means of actions instead of leverage, I mean, using the protest and other also use it as a vehicle for their personal achievement of taking power and even perpetuating and more abuses uh, compared to those who have been to power? And that's, that is my, my, my question. Thank you. Thank you, Leandro. Um, 
I think the question goes to all our panelists, all any person in the audience. But if I could do, throw back the question to you, which other alternative would you suggest in case you have one in mind, you know, so, so that we can ping pong around it, we can uh, uh, share, I mean, brainstorm around it. If you have any, would be happy to hear uh, from you. But I agree with you. There could be other alternatives uh, that we can use. Um, as if I saw another hand. Leandro, are you still up? No, sorry, it was a okay. hell yeah. Okay. But please, if you have any alternative, uh, please, I'm not putting you on the spot, but just to-, um, to Yes, to I think, okay. I think, I mean, I don't have any now in my mind, but maybe this could be some of the question that this project or this initiative could address, yes. looking at exactly. alternative and all that. Thank you. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much. Um, any other um, comment, question? Otherwise, uh, are you done? Uh, could uh, respond. That's the question that directly came to you. Um, okay, there is uh, a hand. Let's take the this hand and then we come to the um, answers. Beardo, Elise. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, my question. You. Okay, thank you. My question has to do with the impartiality of civil society in our country here, mostly in Francophone country, where, whereby when there is a situation in our country and a civil, so, so, if you, a civil society come, come out and speak out about uh, what is going on, like any civic situation, any civic challenges, the, the power will deem that organization as being partial, as being like in the opposition side, though, that issue is real and we are we will be experiencing but it's made as uh, uh there's the any any reclamation so so weak so they, they they keep saying that they are they are from the opposition side so how how can we really advocate how can civil society advocate for any situation that is going on in their country and being impartial, not being deemed as be, uh, as coming from or uh, 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 belonging from the opposition. That's my my question. Thank you. David, please you are, you have the hand. Then we can go to the questions. David Joseph. Yes. Um. Thank you very much. Um. My concern, my own question is going to the uh, previous speakers. And my concern is how do we ensure that we maintain unity and oneness among CSOs? Because all those issues coming up has been a contributing factor. One, fighting for resources and also maintaining status quo. Those who have been there for the past 20, 30 years are still at the helm of uh, affairs of civil society. How do we ensure that we bring unity and oneness among us and also to, make, to, to organize ourselves to have a centralized body of CSOs at different chapters at national level and within regions as a civil society. So with those issues, if we are able to organize ourselves, for instance, for us in Sierra Leone, we have the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists, which is the umbrella body of journalists of, that are operating in Sierra Leone. How do we ensure that as civil society, we have such similar body operating in our country? That's my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Yes, I had picked it from the chat uh, room. Um, thank you for bringing it up here. Okay, to our panelists, please, um, maybe Abiodun and then Kojo and Aisha as uh, we presented. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, if I recall, Daniel's question was about civil society apathy. You was asking if we have not become um, quiet and desensitized and tired because of, 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 of um, the, the lack of impact we seemingly are having. Um, first that, yes, we are tired and, and that there's nothing wrong in admitting that there's a general exhaustion in the sector. Like we say in Nigeria, every day is one day, one in trouble for civil society and that um, 
governments because of the total authoritarian power they've given themselves are beginning to not beginning are largely um, desensitized to protest to forms of dissent to demand for accountability that is there and that's not going to go away very fast what should change and what will change is ensuring that we're able to ensure the resilience of those who do this work like i said um, previously we must also be able to ensure that there's solidarity for them so they know that they do not stand um, they do not stand alone where we must also ensure that um, their voices um, th that they, they realize that their voices do have impact one of the things about the work we do when it comes to governance and human rights is that the, the true result that we are making impact is that things are, are not worse than they currently are. And so you, that's very difficult to measure. And we must remind ourselves of this. And people say, oh, well, that, that how do you know that you have, have an impact with regards to human rights? Well, it, it's not that human rights are not being violated, but that things would be worse if we were not doing the work that we do. And we need to remind not just ourselves, but the general public of this as well. Thank you. I don't know if there are other, any other questions you wanted me to also specifically answer. Generally, the questions were coming to the panelists, all to all of us. So it is only one that question that uh, directly came uh, to you, uh, but maybe uh, um, I think um, there was someone, I think from Ghana, who specifically yeah. was talking about the context in Ghana, then could go to Kojo. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, let me uh, react to the issue of our protest and uh, impartiality of, of civil society. So, I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at the Afrobarometer surveys, for instance, in terms of civic activism, when you ask people, you know, are they prepared to join a protest? It was always, the numbers were always very low, but that has been increasing in, 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 in the last couple of rounds. Um, and I think it's partly, as I said, it's a function of, of, of generally having a very young continent. Um, and, and the kinds of energies that young people have, they might not be more akin to writing <laughs> to an MP or, or, or something like that, right? So, so my, my sense, as I said, is that we are going to have these kinds of civic expressions and civic uh, uh, formations where people want to go out and uh, uh, express their dissent. And the, 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 re, the way to deal with that is to really re look at our public order laws uh, and how we apply it. Most yeah, times it's, yeah, it's applied yeah, selectively, um, depending on whether you are seen as a a sympathizer of the regime or not. So those things have to be reformed. And also the standard operating procedures that the police use in sort of managing crowds and protests and so on have to be completely reviewed because those are the ways in which you can hold people accountable when, when they, they go off track. So the, this is a, an area that I think is really important for us to safeguard, uh, uh, to manage and, and make sure that there's proper accountability. So that's what I have to say about that. Uh, on the impartiality issue, you see, we have to, you have to fight for the space. You, every citizen has a right uh, to express an opinion on anything that government is doing with their taxpayers' money and any decisions that they are making that is going to impact on their lives. So being classified or categorized as, uh, you know, opposition supporter and all of those things, that is coming from people who don't want, you know, criticism, don't want accountability. So there's not much you can do about that. You have to educate the public to appreciate that in a democracy, this is what happens. And that when you are criticizing government or critiquing, or even you're doing it constructively, is to make sure that uh, the outcomes of, of these decision-making uh, benefits the majority of citizens. So this is a space that has to be fought for. Uh, people, other people have agendas, you know, to try to close that space, to try to kind of push you away from that space because they don't want accountability. And that's why you, the, the most important thing that would happen is that if you are, you are there long enough, the citizens will understand that, you know, whichever government comes, you are still uh, uh, completely committed 
to the broader goals of governance, uh, good governance. Thank you very much. Um, yes, there is one question, how do we maintain unity and oneness among activists? But there is also um, a question directed to Aisha. Um, I hear you talk about an organization that closed their account because they had challenge with taxes. I'm interested to find out from you what are the statutory regulations to civil society organization in Senegal I have to comply to. For instance, in Nigeria, we have 21 regulations with the nine major ones. Do you know how many regulations Senegalese NGOs have to comply? If you don't have this information, can okay. So um, the question is about the legal framework in uh, Senegal. Please, if you in one minute, if you have the information at your um, disposal, please, and then um, uh, who can um, uh, articulate the issue of uh, unity and oneness in one minute as well. Then we close this session. Thank you very much. Aisha? Not sure we still have Aisha, uh, but uh, in the event that she's disconnected, anybody who wants to give a stab on how do we maintain unity and oneness? Because the member is saying that the old uh, tax that have been at the helm of NGOs are still there. So, um, does that tarry with uh, what uh, Abidjan was talking about as well as Aisha in terms of recruiting or empowering the future? Uh, so, I mean, um, yeah, that's how I can uh, contextualize the question. So okay. I, I, yeah. okay. Please go ahead, Nana. No, I saw your hand up. So I was going to say, I think Abdiodu wants to respond to that. But I, I really believe that, I mean, when it comes to unity, we've been talking a lot about building solidarity. Um, I mean, unity does not necessarily mean that everybody um, should, should um, necessarily have the same, um, you know, the same stance on everything. But I believe it's about principles. And, and agreeing on principle. And when it comes to civic space and the actors within it, and all the, the speakers here have spoken about the fact that we have that right um, to have that space to engage. And civil society um, actors, at least for, 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 for as long as I have known, one of the things that have been challenging for us is the competition for resources and which has created a certain unhealthy um, relationship at certain points. And sometimes it's about working in silos because you want to be the one who is seen, which then informs the fact that you are the one who gets the resources to be able to do your job and, and do it well. And, and, and I think those are some of the things that we have to address and, and look at the causes, the reasons for which we are doing this work and the fact that when we work together, we are able to even achieve more. So for me, it is um, something that all of us uh, would have to commit to, um, building that solidarity, because it used to be there, but you know, it has, it has been affected negatively as time has gone on. So we need to bring that back. And, and, and we need to work on it. And this resource hub um, is supposed to also contribute to that. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say that that is also part of one of, one of the things that we will be working on. Yeah, thank you very much. Capitalism has not only entered in the business world um, all in the government um, um, underpinnings and the workings Capitalism has also penetrated in civil society organizations to the extent now that money, 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 money. So if I can dig the funding uh, somewhere, then I will not tell Wax how to tap on that resource. Or if I get it, I will want to utilize it alone so that tomorrow I can go back and get it. And that in effect, 
gives a leeway to our governments to crush us. Because when they get to know that you are the big, um, you are the pillar, they crush you, then you hear the what used to be there is no longer there. But if we go as a group, I mean, they will not crush us as a group. They will crush one, one continues. But if you go alone, um, yes, uh, that is what I can uh, um, add on to Nana's point. Thank you very much, our panelists. Please, um, um, we need to really appreciate them and give, the, give them um, uh, join our hands together and we thank them for our um, session and for good um, and uh, informative uh, context in the countries they have given us. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, to our next segment, I will need to rush to it because um, it introduces more to what actually the recommendations have been uh, put forward by our panelists here and what we need to focus on uh, in terms of building a space for, um, for a platform for our civic space. And that is launching our civic space hub. In its, um, if you can really contextualize the hub in its, uh, the word as it is, uh, it should be something to hold us all. It should be a center where are we a point where we can all engage in terms of uh, civic space. Um, we'll have an introduction and um, a brief um, overview of what is this hub about and how um, can you, the person in Sierra Leone, the other one in Benin, in Senegal, how can you be helped by this hub? Is it only established in Ghana or even me outside the West Africa can benefit from this. To look at this, we have uh, Dabe Saki, Mark Ikemanjima, uh, Senior Program Officer, West African Ford Foundation. Uh, please uh, take us through um, this and uh, um, um, we understand uh, what is all about. But before that, uh, we need to know that Dabe, Dabe Saki is, is, um, is based in the foundation's uh, office for West Africa in Lagos. He currently works at the intersection between gender, natural resources, and manages grant making that integrates women and girls, disability and youth lenses across these two domains. His work actively promotes the inclusion of the voices of diverse groups and perspectives, including youth and people with disabilities. He holds a PhD in International Development and MA in Development Studies from the University of East Anglia and a bachelor's degree in Educational Psychology from Rivers State College of Education. He was previously an external research associate at the University of East Anglia and is a visiting researcher at the University of Witzvatersrand in South Africa. The Basaki, the floor is yours. And please, you have five minutes to take us through the, um, the overview. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you, thanks for the generous introduction. Um, I think my task is simple here. I, I would do three things and I would do them very quickly. The first is to say thank you to everybody. At the peak, there were about 151 people here on this call, you know. So thank you to everybody for making the time to join. Uh, but more specifically, thank you to all our partners, um, WAXI, colleagues at WAXI, uh, colleagues at Spaces for Change, for all the efforts to get the resource hubs, um, the resource hub moving and serving the needs of civil society organizations in, in West Africa. So that's my first uh, task. My second task is to speak a little bit about, you know, why, you know, we need to have these res the resource hub uh, and what it represents for our region. So let me say this, that a lot of the background has been provided by the previous speakers. I'm not going to try and repeat what's been said already. Uh, but just to say that there were a number of things that came up for me in when each of the panelists were speaking. Uh, the last couple of ones were about solidarity and resilience. 
Uh, and I think these are, you know, obviously very important issues in, in our region, uh, particularly given the rising changes in our context, both in terms of uh, backsliding democratic countries, as well as, you know, changes in regimes uh, in different countries. I think the video that was showed earlier um, talked about, you know, uh, Guinea uh, as an example of a country where democracy has been upturned, you know, by uh, a different system of administration. Uh, so those two issues, uh, solidarity and resilience, are obviously very important. Uh, but also in the context of COVID, you know, giving the shrinking space in terms of funding to civil society organizations, we could not think of a better time to really be thinking about how to strengthen civil society organizations in terms of their ability to continue to exist. And one axis of that is uh, thinking about, you know, the process of building legitimacy. And the other aspect of that is thinking about ways to strengthen the financial base of organizations in our region. Um, in terms of the, the first piece, you know, um, legitimacy, there is also the question of storytelling. How are civil society organizations telling the story of the work that they do? How do we, how do civil society organizations, you know, make sure that there is no misperception of their role and contribution in the societies in which we operate in the region. Uh, and so that brings the piece about really thinking closely in terms of um, strategic communications. And I think that came up in a number of the uh, different presentations that were, were shared earlier. And then two additional pieces here would be the question around um, digital security and surveillance you know, by states in the region. Uh, again, um, one of our colleagues asked the question about, you know, is, is protest now redundant? You know, should we be thinking about alternative ways of protesting? Actually, you know, protesting in the streets continues to play a role, but also we have seen in the last 10 years a shift, particularly among the young population in, in protests from the streets to digital spaces. So in some sense, you know, there alternatives that are being used now by young people across the region you know, to um, contest decisions that are made by the states in which they, you know, in which they exist. And given that states are now increasingly also clamping down on the digital space, both in terms of surveillance as well as in terms of using uh, policies to constrain you know, the ability of citizens to use digital spaces. Uh, the last thing that was said that caught my attention is the question of governance, you know, and I think, you know, it connects again back to the question of legitimacy, it connects back to the question of, you know, how civil society organizations are telling their stories. For me, if we stay with these five issues, you know, that came up from all the discussions in the panel, they form an important basis to think about a way to respond to and support civil society organizations across West Africa. So in some sense, one can say that the attempt to create a resource hub really is an attempt to respond to these five and many other issues that have been raised um, this morning and afternoon. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I would like to say is that, you know, the resource hubs that we are trying to establish in, in West Africa is really part of a global network of resource hubs. And I think my colleague uh, Funke had, had said this earlier, Ford is establishing these hubs. And as at the last count in, in February, there were eight of these around the world, uh, cutting across Asia, um, Africa, and countries in Latin America. And the idea is to really be able to contribute in some way to um, addressing some of the issues that we've been discussing this morning. Um, we hope that these hubs will all you know, be connected in some way uh, over the period that they exist so that they're not just supporting civil society in their specific regions of operation, but that they're also in a position themselves to support each other, to learn from each other, to draw on the strategies that each of the hubs is applying in, in the regions where they work um, and to be able to then create a sort of coherent uh, global community of resource hubs that are uh, networked and feed from each other's you know, learnings and strategies and opportunities. Um, I would not talk about the objectives of the hub because I think Omolara would do that. So I'm going to skip that uh, and just say, one last thing about my second point before I go to my third point. Uh, 
I would like to say that, you know, as a foundation, we're definitely committed to working with civil society organizations in West Africa. We have been here uh, for many, many years, for more than 60 years, we have been here in West Africa. And we believe that a strong uh, civil society uh, is needed in order to be able to do a lot of the things that people said, you know, make sure that the private sector is stronger, but make sure that society is stronger for everybody's benefit. Uh, and so the resource hubs, you know, specifically supporting the civic space is one way that we believe we would continue to contribute to um, the resilience of uh, not just civil society organizations, but countries in, in West Africa. Now, let me go on to my third point, Paul, and that would be the, probably the shortest part of my uh, role here. So Omolara asked me to say specifically, and I'm just going to read from the message that she sent to me, that I should say that on behalf of the Ford Foundation, uh, Spaces for Change and the West Africa Civil Society Institute, um, that I am launching the resource hub for West Africa. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we we'll take it the way it has come. Thank you uh, for the good words and for launching um, uh, the hub. Uh, and Omar, thank you very much for telling him to launch the <laughs> to launch the hub. Yes, um, the next um, uh, um, session or the next segment is now about the hub. Yes. It has been launched, but then what is it? So what are the objectives? What are the goals? How do I come in as an activist, as a civil, um, I mean, a civic space actor in my uh, context? How do I come in? Waxi and um, um, uh, Space for Changes uh, will tell us in less than 10 minutes, please, because we need to save some time so that people can ask you um, how, when can I come to that hub and where is that hub located? Please, works and the spaces for change, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Paul and, and Debasaki. Thank you so much. That was an interesting one. I thought we had a private conversation, you know. <laughs> But it's good. Thank you so much, colleagues, the speakers, um, Paul, for moderating this so brilliantly. And to all participants, thank you so much. So I will just share my screen very briefly. Uh, OK. So I have a very small, you know, few slides to share, very scant one, I must say because we expect questions to come from, from colleagues. So uh, this is about the hub. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, this is a five-year initiative that is being supported by the Ford Foundation and the objectives are quite uh, simple. First, it seeks to enhance civil society's organizational resilience and operational efficiency. How are civil society responding to various governance uh, directives in their respective countries? How are they compliance to the policies guiding the sector before they even begin to demand for uh, uh, expanded civic space, free civic space for uh, citizens uh, to enhance citizens' organizations and mobilization and also uh, a demand for accountability from government. It also seeks specifically to enhance civil society's ability to assess are the environment in which we work and also identify the gaps, the emerging issues within the environment and identify and ways- And she that about the climate change and how it hits all- Hello, please, can we mute the, 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 the speakers, please? Waxi and uh, Spaces for Change team. And also knowing the best strategy to respond to these issues within their respective countries and it also seeks to strengthen their organization now, their organization's ability to mobilize resources, like I said, uh, uh, at the start. This is going to be for five years. We're expecting other partners to plug into this along the line. And of course, for these organizations to have the right skills and exposure to mobilize resources to support the work they are doing around civic space and strengthen their financial residence and, man and overall management. 
And the, uh, 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 the final objective is also to invest and enhance the, uh, uh, into in the technology infrastructures of this organization, their ability to protect themselves against growing government surveillances, you know, having the right infrastructures in place, uh, data protections, digital security, you know, general awareness around uh, technology uh, issues uh, across uh, uh, the, the region. So these are the objectives that the, the uh, project seeks to address. Uh, in terms of the pillars, uh, we have four strategic pillars that the project will focus on. Like I mentioned, is going to focus on organizational governance, i.e. Uh, organizations' ability to be compliant, their compliance status uh, to regulatories and legislations within their respective countries, their financial resiliency, organizational systems, uh, financial uh, status and management thereof, and secondly, is the digital security and protection. So we have loads of capacity strengthening programs and support that we have designed um, under each of these pillars. Uh, the third one is civic space protections and enabling environments uh, uh, support. Uh, some we come in, in, in the form of trainings, workshop, others we come in the form of facilitation, technical support. And finally, uh, the third pillar is that space that will continue to create, to create over the next five years to uh, facilitate and encourage dialogues around these issues, civic space, digital protections, uh, organizational resilience building. We'll also use that platform to facilitate advocacy to help us in achieve the, achieving the overall goal, as well as you know, strengthening the organization's communications ability, strategic communications to be specific. Um, the focus countries for the next five years, we have Ghana, we have Nigeria and Senegal, but we wouldn't be blinded to uh, emerging issues around us. So periodically the project will be responding to uh, regional issues as it, you know, uh, as it emerge around civic, civic space specifically. So uh, even if uh, an issue is not happening in Nigeria, Ghana and Senegal, but it's something that requires regional intervention, the hub will be uh, uh, making room for such interventions. So the target audience, we have civil society organizations in these specific uh, countries, Ghana, Nigeria, and, 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 and Senegal. But of course, like I said, regional issues that requires, you know, our collective uh, our support, the hub will as much as possible facilitate those interventions. So by civil society organizations, I mean the non-governmental organizations, be it at the national or regional uh, operating uh, within national uh, boundaries or, or regional and um, women's groups, uh, youth networks, associations. I mean, all those entities that are found within civil society sector will be the target for, for, this, uh, um, for this project. And of course, civil society networks, national networks, and so on, they can participate in this project. And how can they participate? We, uh, 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 I mean, the project is now launched, so we'll be reaching out to every one of us to uh, um, um, seek, I mean, to show your interest to be part of this process. Uh, regardless, uh, we will be looking at organizations that are in dear need of this, of this support, organizations whose um, mission and vision and hands-on work it's really focusing on expanding civic space or those who are currently, you know, tackling these challenges in their, in, in these countries. And of course, regionally, uh, they can approach us to be part of this project. We would also, uh, in few days uh, or few hours, we'll be reaching out to organizations to also uh, showcase their interest by sharing some information that we would then now assess to see their, uh, uh, their uh, qualifications and, and, you know, to participate in the, in the project. Um, the coordinating partners, I think we've talked more about this, it's gonna be WAXI and Spaces for Change and Ford Foundation is supporting the initiative. In addition to that, we're gonna be working closely with a pool of technical partners. These are partners who have the right expertise around uh, digital issues, technology protection, uh, data protection, uh, digital security, organizational governance, financial resilience, 
uh, civic space uh, uh, actors who can easily you know, pass across information and, and, and lessons learned and skills to other organizations that may need you know, such support. So it, it's even though WACSI and Spaces for Change will be driving this initiative across the countries and the region, we will be working with technical partners who actually have the expertise to provide support over the next five years uh, uh, that this project will be on. So there are a lot more information to share and we would uh, appreciate if you can reach reach out to us at info at waxy.org, info at waxy and info at spacesforchange.org for more information. I know you have a lot of questions or even for questions that we may not be able to take on this floor right now. Uh, so Paul, I, I was trying to meet the time, so I had to present this very scanty um, uh, slides, but I, I want to believe that the information is, is well passed, but I'm hoping to, and um, with my colleagues, to respond to any immediate questions we may have. Otherwise, we can we can write to these two organizations for more information on the project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omoala. At least now I see where I can come in in the hub um, and where, how I can participate, especially and particularly looking at the objectives and the pillars it's so um, clear. Please, actors, fellow activists, and um, civil society um, organization representatives, let's engage in this hub. Let's um, interest ourselves um, in the civic space um, hub. Uh, comments and questions um, will again open for five minutes, and it's first come, first serve when the space is still available, please. Um, after that, we'll go for the climax of our session um, to listen to um, one of our current philosopher and great, uh, uh, great speaker of our times. Uh, yes, we need to celebrate some of these, um, some of these uh, people some before uh, they go away and then we begin uh, narrating. Uh, Hamidu Mosa, you have the floor, please be brief, be succinct on your point. And um, if you, um, uh, I think we only had one speaker, so your question, I guess, is directed <laughs> merci, to Omar. Merci, Paul. Uh, merci vraiment de créer ce cadre pour que nous puissions échanger sur une thématique aussi importante que l'espace civique. Parce que nous, chez nous, aujourd'hui au Niger, on ne parle plus de, du rétrécissement de l'espace civique, ça va vers la fermeture. Euh, maintenant, je m'en vais poser la question par rapport au centre. Et effectivement, nous avions vu euh, comment on avait décliné les objectifs du centre. Mais maintenant, comment se fait le fonctionnement de ce centre et, qui sera vraiment un centre très utile toutes les organisations euh, ouest africaines en général et en particulier les trois pays où euh, euh, le, 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 la fondation Ford avait mis l'accent. Voilà en fait ma question que j'avais voulu poser. Thank you, thank you. Any other question? Any other question? In the meantime, Omar, if you can tell us how is it going to function? Is it an office? Is it a, a building? Is, I mean, how is it going to function? Thank you. Oh, yeah, there is another you. question. Sorry, Omar. Exactly. Sorry, there yeah. is uh, Zurka name. Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. Can you unmute if in case you are talking? Okay, uh, Omo, let's go. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Please speak. The floor okay, is yours. You can hear me now. Good afternoon, sir. My question is what is the aims and objective of this, uh, uh, what do you call it, of this uh, meeting that we are doing now? 
Okay. That is okay. Mission. Yes, objectives and mission of this thing we are doing now. Omar yeah. will be able to tell us. Um, okay, thank you, Joseph. Pangbe. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I would also like to know what are the criteria and then uh, the processes that a civil society or qualified civil society would have to go through before being part of all, being part of this particular uh, help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Omar, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Paul, and, and uh, uh, those colleagues who asked the questions. So the first question is, how will it function? So this is a resource hub. It is not an office. I mean, we're not creating a new office located somewhere. This is a hub that is being coordinated by two uh, partner organizations. Spaces for Change is based in Nigeria. And then Waxi is based in Accra and, 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 and then has, you know, regional, uh, regional uh, work, works regionally as Waxi. So both organizations will be managing the affairs of the hub, which strictly is to provide capacity support to civil society organizations that will be participating in their hub. So it is not going to be outside the two organizations. They will be managing the affairs of the hub. They will be curating the, they will be developing the different training programs, uh, technical support, capacity support that civil society needs and will be delivering such in collaboration with other technical partners that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the aims and objective of the this meeting. Okay, this meeting is for us to further, uh, you know, converse around civic space issues in West Africa. And also for us, Waxi Spaces for Change, and of course our partners, Ford Foundation, to share with you some of the things we have been doing behind you know, the closed doors and the conversation we've been having, the thinking uh, and how to respond and support civil society organizations working around civic space. So to let you know, to create awareness that yes, this is how far we have thought about this project. This is what we have put together. What do you think about it? And that's why we appreciate these questions that you are asking. And uh, so this is what this meeting is all about, to tell you about the work we have been doing, and of course, to formally launch this initiative. And we expect your, your, your comment questions like you're already bringing in, uh, uh, them in are the criteria for qualification. So we have two approaches on this. And I was really thinking uh, it's something that we can share with you afterwards, but it's good that you already asked for it. To participate in the hub, you must be a legally registered civil society organization in these three countries. And you must be working around issues of civic space, closing civic space, democratic governance or democratic consolidation, you know, uh, human rights issues, you're responding to various elements of civic space, uh, um, uh, digital protections and all of that, or you are online activist or your organization is responding or you're a social movement, uh, whatever you're doing, you must have a strong element of it focusing on civic space. So you must be a CSO in your country, maybe NGO, CBO, community-based organizations, whatever level of civil society organization you are, you must be legally registered in these three countries. And the work that you do must have strong element of civic space issues. We are gonna ask you, which aspect of civic space issues are you addressing as an organization? What are the capacity gaps you are facing? And if uh, we are hoping that you would need um, support in those, uh, areas that the, the the four pillars that we we had, had, had shared and yes then we're going to review review this this applications and then we can uh, uh, you know come together and and, and agree on uh, who meets all the requirements who actually needs this this kind of support I do understand that all the organizations in these countries do not have this, this the same you know similar level of, of capacity so we, we, we would see, those that really, really needed to move to the next step of their interventions in their countries. So um, uh, I think I have addressed the questions. If I didn't, please, you can just let me know and then um, I can speak to it. Yeah. Paul. 
there's another one uh, or two. Uh, one is, um, I think the uh, hub can work well with focal points at national level. That is like a question. I think the person is asking, will you be having focal points at the national level? Then another one is, will there be some fee to access this hub? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, the idea of focal points, uh, I, I, I don't quite understand, but what I know is the two coordinating organizations have put systems and structures in place to reach the different countries, these three countries and, and, and provide the necessary capacity support, which the hub you know, seeks to provide. We have put systems and you know, personnel in place to address that. So the idea of focal points, uh, so I can say we, we, we have focal points within the organizations, if, if you allow me. And then would you need to pay something to assess the hub? No, no. So this is something that is currently being supported by Ford and the capacity support will be provided to those who meet the criteria that the, 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 the hub puts forth and uh, they don't add, I mean, they don't have to pay anything now. No, there's nothing like that. I can see Hello. Joseph. Thank I don't know. Yes, that's Joseph, that, sh that should be the last one. Joseph, please. Oh, Joseph, there is Hamidu. Uh, Joseph, uh, 30 seconds. Hamidu, 30 seconds, please. Thank you. Hello, thank you. I would like to note whether uh, in in the various or respective uh, countries, the, the partner organization or the partner coordinators would do the selection of the CSOs by themselves, or is there going to be a launch of application where uh, civil society organizations or NGOs or community-based organizations would then apply uh, for this particular hub? So I just want to know the difference. Is, it, is there going to be a way that the coordinators we select a uh, uh, participant or there's going to be a launch of application that various organizations will be able to register or apply for the, the opportunity. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, we would have um, you know, different approaches to the selections of participants. And uh, by the time we're, we're putting um, an information uh, 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 documents together, which we are going to share. So there will be some organizations that would, you know, uh, we're putting a web page, sorry, together, which we're going to share with everyone on this call and those who are unable to make the call, where we would have a section where um, civil society would have to apply to participate. And of course, some uh, other organizations will be identified, I mean, because we, we, we know the work they do and then there will be some, some vetting processes to really see those who, who qualifies for that. But yes, there will be uh, applications process and we're gonna share more information around that in another couple of days via uh, a web page that we're going to, we're, we're working on and, and which will have more information on, the, on the, the application processes and participation generally. So we're gonna have uh, you know, uh, different approaches to selections of, of uh, participants. Yep. Um, Hamidu, I see there is another question uh, which uh, I will give to you, uh, Omar, at the end, uh, if Hamidu can give us. Uh, in 30 seconds, please, Hamidu, be brief and succinct. Merci, merci Paul. Merci, Paul. Merci. Uh, ma question c'est de savoir, uh, qu'en est-il pour les organisations de la société civile la West africaine qui ne font pas partir de ces trois pays. Par exemple, nous, chez nous, au Niger, notre organisation, le ROTA, le réseau des organisations pour la transparence et l'analyse budgétaire, travaille beaucoup sur cette question de l'espace civique et de la transparence, ainsi que la Oui, mais, mais comment nous, nous pouvons vraiment bénéficier de ce... Thank you. Yes, the point uh, is taken. What are we doing for other countries? Yes, uh, thank you, Paul. I think that was one question 
I was waiting for. And as you were counting the 20 questions, I'm like, okay, yes, that question is not coming. <laughs> but eventually came. So like I said in my presentation, we have the hub has a room to address regional uh, initiatives, you know, uh, to respond to regional issues. So if your organization is not operating in any of these three countries, i.e. Ghana, Nigeria, and Senegal, you can still approach the hub with uh, um, the situation in your country or what you're working on that you think that the hub should respond you know, should assist or respond to or that your organizations or your country should benefit from what the hub has to offer. And then we would have to have a look at that and, and, and you know, uh, uh, deliberate and see how much of a support the hub can provide in that respect. But primarily the hub we focus its interventions in these three countries. Um, yes, for a start. So regardless of where you're located, still, you know, approach the hub. We're going to look at uh, uh, each, um, um, each on a case by case, you know, basis, and then we 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 we'll discuss and uh, within the management uh, uh, team and, and partner organizations to see if and how we can provide support to um, civic space issues that's is happening in your country that your organization is working on. As, I mean, it's a lot easier if it has regional undertone because then we have within the hub already uh, uh, opportunity to uh, respond to regional initiative, you know? Yes. I hope I answered Thank your you. question. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I think the question is answered. I was also waiting for that. Sorry, Paul. Um, Yes, please. Sorry, one minute, and I know we have about three minutes to close the, 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 the meeting. There's a question that says, how can the countries outside the three participating countries benefit from the critical knowledge generated from the hub? So yes, we are working on a web page where everything the hub is doing will be published and we will be sharing that we're going to be communicating with the larger civil society and uh, our sector in the region on what the hub is doing, the issue the hub is responding to at national and of course at regional level. And at, so, and we would be having like at, at the fourth pillar that talks about policy dialogues and really galvanizing conversation around uh, civic space issues. So that's gonna be open to everyone for us to discuss and then, you know, uh, um, uh, contributes to regional uh, emerging issues around, around civic space, for example, this democratic retrogression and all of that. So we'll be calling on everyone from time to time, you know, to participate in the broader uh, uh, conversations and, and intervention of the hub at the regional level. Thank you very much. Um, I thought you had uh, mentioned uh, uh, something to that um, regard. So I had left that question, but thanks for nuancing it and uh, emphasizing some of the points. At this point, um, uh, friends and colleagues, allow me to invite our keynote uh, speaker um, who is going to um, inform us broadly of what is happening around the world, what is happening in the corners of Africa, what is happening in the context of West Africa. Um, but maybe before I call um, our speaker, just to thank um, um, Omar, to thank uh, Dabesaki Dabe for launching uh, this hub. And I know questions are many, but please, uh, as you mentioned, uh, they can contact you online so that um, we go, uh, we get the information that we need. Um, to give us the key uh, uh, keynote and um, appreciate more of what we are doing around this context, is Ibrahima Ken um, open, from Open Society Foundations. Ibrahima uh, is the co-chair of advocacy and engagement at the Open Society Foundations. Uh, prior to this, he was the head of African Union Advocacy Program at Open Society Foundation Regional Office. Um, he's a lawyer qualified in both Senegal and France. And before joining Open Society Initiative for Eastern Africa in 2007, he was a senior lawyer in charge of the African program at Interrights for 10 years as founding member of RADO, 
a Senegalese human rights organization, Ken led a program focusing on public education and women's human rights for six years in five West African countries, Cape Verde, Republic of Guinea, Republic of uh, um, Guinea-Bissau, Mauritania, and Senegal. Ibrahim has also worked closely with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, at the African Commission and the African Committee of Experts of the Rights of Welfare of the Child, the Court of Justice for the Economic Community of West African States, and the Court of Justice for the East African Community. Kane, the floor is yours to listen uh, from you. I hope he is connected. Otherwise, I can't withdraw my introduction. <laughs> um, um, yes, Paul, I think uh, Ibrahim may be struggling to, to connect at this moment. Um, just a second, let me confirm. But please, please. I saw please. him a few minutes ago. Okay. So I think Ibrahim is not, yeah, is not here. But I can assure you and everyone that um, if it's unable to join on in another one minute, we would get a, a speech and have it published you know, widely, and then we'll send it to you. We have all your emails uh, that you registered with. So we're going to share mm. the speech with you. Uh, so Paul, yeah. OK. Uh, we, OK. Yes, but at least we've known who Ibrahima is. And um, I can attest to this. Uh, I met Ibrahima um, 15 years ago yeah, when he was working at InterRights. He's such a resource. He's such um, um, an activist to reckon with and to collaborate with, please. Um, people in the West African uh, corner, you are very blessed to have this uh, person amidst you. Um, that um, not happy that um, it is not uh, with us, but it has cleared some space. Then we either go back to questions with Omarara or we go now uh, a way forward as we close. Um, but if there is any lingering question, please um, push it into the chat as we look at the way forward, then we and closing remarks, then we can see how uh, those um, questions or comments can come uh, through. Uh, works, um, Spaces for Change, and Ford Foundation, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And really, Kojo, I agree with your comments in the in the chats that it's such a shame that Ibrahim couldn't join us. Um, he definitely wanted to be here. In fact, I, I had a conversation with him this morning. Um, he was going to have some challenges joining earlier, but he was definitely planning on joining us by now. So something must have happened um, to prevent him from doing so. And that is the reason why knowing who he is and what he would have shared with us, I we think it's very important um, to ensure that you get a text, even if you can't hear and see him speak um, during this time, the text at least for that. What I want to close with, um, and I can see all the questions coming, and we would have many more questions. We are launching the hub, the, the hub, and definitely it is something that we are going to continue to build on. Victoria mentioned earlier when she was talking, uh, my, my colleague from Spaces for Change, that this is not a waxy hub or a Spaces for Change hub or a Ford Foundation hub. This is ours for all of us. Um, working and wanting to protect civic space and in this region. So what that also means is that in developing or building the hub, we are not going to be doing it sitting in some small corner in space, thinking alone and doing it alone, but we'll be doing it with you. The hub is a resource for civil society. It's supposed to support the work that you do. And so there are different areas, different gaps, capacity gaps that you would also have to be informing us about so that we can work together with you. And many of the technical partners are going to be coming from amongst us. 
we are going to be working with organizations that have skills to share um, tools to share methodologies to share different things to do and we are going to be working on solidarity <laughs> together apart to matter sorry for your for your uh would they, they say bless you <laughs> <laughs> in our culture they'll say more life to you so more life to you so um um really uh we are we we are happy um for this opportunity for civil society we've been talking about working in unity not working in silos i think this is an opportunity for us to do that so please let's take that opportunity and work together and find the answers to the problems that we are facing in addressing the civic space issue. And many of us have answers. So let's use the, the facility of this hub to provide those answers to the problems that we are facing. And yes, we are starting in terms of focus with Nigeria, Ghana, and Senegal, but this is really an issue of a limitation of resources because you cannot have it for everybody. But as Lara has said, there are regional challenges that we would have to face regionally, and there are resources that will be shared regionally. So it's not only these countries. These countries are just starters um, and also to help us manage the resources that we have now. So thank you for being here and joining us to- well, Let me just add something to the, no, just that last, last point um, yeah. about some of the challenges, or oh, there'll be opportunity. Um, in addition to everything that you said, there will be opportunity for civil society to the, um, benefit from tailored trainings that address their own unique organizational challenges. So um, that is also an opportunity to develop the program together to make sure it's definitely it's specifically responsive to your own unique needs, the needs of your own organization, but across those pillars that we've discussed, whether it's around your regulatory compliance challenges, whether it's your governance, whether it's your digital spaces that you're using, or in terms of building knowledge to deepen your civic space advocacy. So it is a journey that is just started today that all of us are going to go through together. Um, a lot of the things are not like clearly defined now because we are going to do it together with you in terms of the methodologies, in terms of the strategies, in terms of the locations, in terms of the outcomes that you want to achieve. So it's going to be a, we're going to work hand in hand, you know, during this process and ensure that um, together that we really win in uh, the advocacy to preserve our civic space from further restrictions from our various governments. So. Back to you, Thank you, Victoria. On point. Nothing more to add. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a word from Ford Foundation. Well, thank you very much. I think mine is just to say thank you, you know, to you, Paul, for facilitating this and to everyone for joining. Um, Colleagues from Spaces for Change and uh, WAXI have really laid out the next steps in terms of the process, which is, I think, the expectation from for this particular uh, component of the agenda. So you should be on the lookout for the announcements, you know, in terms of uh, the, the nominations or call for participation at in different in different. Um, parts of the program. I believe that the WACSI and Spaces for Change will be starting out with a, a process of identification of potential organizations to work with, uh, and then an assessment, and then training, and then technical support. Uh, so be on the lookout. I imagine that there is a mailing list for this uh, convening. So, um, WACC and Spaces for Change will be sending out uh, resources, starting with um, Ibrahima's uh, speech, but also that that could also serve as a mailing list to share information about the following steps of, of the process. So anyway, just to say thank you. This has been an interesting conversation and uh, 
really looking forward to engaging further with uh, everyone you know in in the context of the hub itself thank you very much dabesaki and the last last uh, session that is remaining is the worst in my uh, entire life and um, i will purpose <laughs> Um, Omo is laughing. Uh, I, I can't handle this uh, purposefully. I will hand over to Omo to take a group photo. I don't know how it is going to happen. Um, I'm always uh, interested in uh, putting people together, not stand like this, do like this. But uh, Omo, please guide us on how this group photo is going to happen and who is going to take it. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Like I call you my Olga. Thank you so much for, for, for doing this amazing job so well for us. We really appreciate from Spaces for Change and, and, and Waxy and thanks to all the speakers. So uh, I do want to say you are calling on the wrong person. I, I want to believe you're even more technologically savvy than I. So Fifi, my colleagues, Fifi and Sefa, how are we taking the group pictures? Uh, I know, they, I don't know, please, can you coordinate us? We, I, but I know we have to put on our cameras. Everyone, let's put yes. on our camera. Yes, Lara. So mm -hmm. I'll please require everybody to put on their cameras and put on a smile as well. So we'll do this on account of three. Um, I can see some people are still kind of put on their cameras. Yes. All right, so on account of three, we are going to take three shots. So I will you all smile. Thank you very much. One, two, three. One, two, three. And the last shot, one, two, three. Thank you all for participation. Thank you. My smile was fading away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Merci, merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Au revoir.